Welcome to the G Max Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Maxwell. Today I am joined with special guest Eric Bach of Bach Performance. Now, Eric, I think he is probably my go to guy when we're talking about athletic training. And he really is a strength coach through and through, I would say. So, Eric, how you doing, man? I'd love it if you could give a brief overview of who you are and what you do for the audience. Awesome. Jason, thank you for being here, or thank you for having me. <laughs> thanks and, for being here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, man, thanks a lot for having me. I'm excited to be here. And uh, yeah, like you mentioned, um, in terms of what I love to do, I love to work with busy guys who want to be able to maintain their athleticism. And I work with a ton of athletes at the same time in terms of, um, you know, guys who are looking to improve their performance, men and women, in terms of lifting more weight, running faster, jumping higher, and building that total high performance body. Um, as it stands today, I do that out of Denver, Colorado, um, training clients most days during the week. I still have my online business, which, you know, definitely in terms of putting out content and helping people from all over the world is excellent. Um, but yeah, through and through, I just love helping my clients improve performance and build a body that looks as well as it performs. That's pretty awesome. So I got to ask you, what's your origin story? Like, how'd you get into fitness and all that stuff? The origin story. All right. So. For me, um, you know, I was blessed to, to grow up in a very active family, and so I was involved in sports growing up, the whole nine yards, football, track, hockey, soccer, basketball, you name it, um, but I was one of the last kids to grow. So as, as it was for me, like, you know, I was always interested in weights. My dad was uh, heavily into martial arts, and uh, so I always saw him doing things, and I was always active, and, you know, like most kids, you see what your dad is doing if you got that good positive environment at home, and you're going to try to mimic what they're doing, and, and so I just started picking up things here and there. But as we got into high school, you know, I'd always been a pretty solid athlete, and I noticed, damn, everybody else was growing while it took me forever. It was, uh, I think at one point... I was uh, 14 or 15 years old, and I was five foot two, 103 pounds, Jeez. And, uh, and, and trying to continue to play football. So at that point, you know, some of that is definitely, you know, genetics and when I hit my growth spurt and whatnot, but um, I remember very vividly during a football practice, and uh, we had a, a rule that was called the rule of 21. As defensive back, you had to have 21 guys that were in front of you. You want to be the last person standing be- between somebody with the ball and the offense. Mm-hmm. And as it happened to be, I was the last guy. had a good angle on this, uh, this teammate just in practice. And he had two decisions. He could either run through me or run to open space. And at that point, it was determined that I was the path of least resistance. And I got <laughs> absolutely trucked, got absolutely destroyed. And, you know, I was just a kid at that point. I wasn't physically or mentally, mentally mature. And <laughs> I got smoked on the field. And part of me, like, sat there and I just, like, man, my face got red, welled up, wanted to cry. And I was like, I mean, I couldn't. I was at practice. And then, like, the jeers kind of started coming in, getting shit from, uh, from teammates and stuff like that. And it was kind of that moment. I was like so disappointed and mad at the same time that I was like, I can either use this as an excuse to quit or I I can use this as motivation to build myself up. And really from that point on, uh, completely obsessed with every aspect of training. I I never missed workouts. Um, I made it more or less my mission to use that pain, that discomfort I felt as kind of like the, the small guy, the last guy growing up to push myself harder than anybody else in the gym. And as that passion continued to grow, obviously I picked up a few things and began to help some of the underclassmen as I, as I grew and as I developed as an athlete and as a, and as a person and, you know, built on that knowledge and really fell in love with the science and, and all the other aspects that, that come with, with hard training and, uh, and turned into a career. Um, it all started really, like I said, with that pain and that moment in wanting to change something so bad and uh, taking action and making it happen. That's pretty funny. That actually reminds me of when I played football in high school. We, we, I went to a school where there wasn't a lot of people, so not a lot of people even tried out for the football team. And there's only one guy that got cut, and it's because he was like five foot one, five foot two, and like 103 pounds. And I remember when we were trying out for the team. Um, the coaches were like you can't hit him low because his calves were so skinny that they thought we were going to break his tibs oh <laughs> man that's oh that's no, no fun yeah. that is no fun yeah it was uh it was it's pretty funny to look back but i'm sure you can empathize with them just because you were that guy but at least you like worked your ass off and uh obviously changed like tremendously 
Um, but in terms of athletic training, you you seem to focus a lot online on athletic training, and that's why I think you're like my go-to guy for that. How did you get into the actual athletic training part of it? Was it just a natural progression from football? You know, some of them was a natural progression because, you know, that's really what I grew up training at first. Um, you know, I, I had a few injuries and stuff like that along the way when I was playing, and when that happened, I was spending some time in the trainer's room. I would just kind of pick the brain of the athletic trainers. And as it happened to be, uh, one of the trainers that was working with our school also worked at a performance facility nearby. And uh, so I did some shadowing and stuff like that in high school. And as I continued to grow and become a better athlete um, and got to the point where he's you know, standing out in track and football, um, you know, I, was, I thought I was fairly well informed for my age. So I went on you know, to college. I was starting to play some college football. And um, unfortunately, I tore my hamstring twice in a five-month period. So Damn. as a uh, yeah, as a five-foot, uh, I ended up being about five nine, about a buck eighty-five at that point. So I grew quite a bit um, throughout that course of time. But my best asset was my speed. And once that kind of went out the window, I wasn't on scholarship. And for me, it was like, okay, I keep battling this. I kind of had a shoulder that was going on, and I was like, okay do I want to keep battling this? I'm not on scholarship. My body's feel, starting to feel pretty beat up. And um, I said at that point, you know, I really love the training aspect and I migrated away from playing the sport to actually becoming part of the strength staff, um, you know, right when I was in school in my undergrad. So about 18 years old, I started working with a couple of the different, uh, different sports teams and, and shadowing and doing some of those things. And that's where the transition became from, you know, being the competitive athlete working on these sports to, really diving into the science a bit more and the coaching aspect and getting to work with athletes and seeing how people, you know, just beyond myself and my own experiences, you know, worked with different training methodologies and, and, and so forth. Nice. So during that time, who do you think were your biggest mentors, um, whether it's in person or just people you followed online? Um, in person, you know, definitely had a very influential high school strength coach. It did take me under his wing at the point when I went, uh, when I really dedicated myself to the gym. So that was, that was excellent. So I definitely look back at the coaches that I had, um, you know, through high school and some of those components and then diving into, into college. One professor in particular, um, helped me out quite a bit. Um, Dr. Jeff Janet, he let me do a ton of shadowing with him. He was kind of the director of our human performance program, which was, um, you know, the, the graduate degree kind of, kind of progress. And he did a lot of work with some of the summer baseball leagues and whatnot. So he was extremely influential in terms of, you know, helping me get my foot in the door and focus on some different aspects and some different opportunities that, um, you know, that most of my classmates did not seek out. Um, in terms of online, I mean, like a lot of guys, I was starting to read everything that was on T Nation. And once I wasn't playing sports as much, I was, you know, 18, 19 years old. I'm like, well, you know what? If I'm uh, not going to be a competitive athlete to the same extent as I was, I'm going to get jacked and try to look good and get a bunch of girls. <laughs> so, you know, I was reading everything that was on there. So everything from, you know, Christian Thibodeau to uh, Jim Wendler's like 531 philosophies have really stood out a ton to me. Uh, Eric Cressy, absolutely fantastic. Um, Nate Green, because he, you know, I'm sure you read a lot of Nate's stuff and he was just so smooth in terms of his presentation, just a down to earth, relatable guy. Yeah, you can just uh, relate so well to him and you just want to read like every single word that he writes. Yeah, yeah, man. And I mean, then reading stuff by John Romanello, kind of the same deal. Mm -hmm. uh, man, so it just kind of led to one thing or another, but it really a lot of the, the T Nation stuff that I started reading around that time really, uh, really influenced me and got me to look at things with a couple different perspectives. Um, compared to what I had been exposed to growing up and, you know, what was happening, you know, at the, you know, undergraduate level, so to speak, which is definitely a little bit different than what actually, uh, actually tends to work when you're working with people hand in hand in hand and in, in person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's funny you mentioned like T Nation because like I, I look at all those guys and I'm like, man, they're legends. But now you're like the T Nation guy. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's, it's really bizarre. It was, um, Man, like the first time I had an article that that went with those guys, I was so stoked. I can't even remember what I did, but I was like, you know, I'd been, uh, you know, been working on writing and, and trying to get in some different areas. And I would I was kind of looking at where the different authors had other places they had written and trying to make some contacts there before I made a pitch to T Nation. And then all of a sudden, um, starting to make those contacts and getting published in there it was really, really a dream come true. And now, anytime I see uh, I see my name on something there, it's still kind of a surreal moment. Um, because, like I said, that's really what was fuel for me to continue learning and these different things that I wanted to experiment, you know, with my body and, and try all these different things and see how they worked. 
but yeah, just it's just kind of bizarre now to be in that position um, where I have coaches that you know were in the same situation that that I was in when I was eighteen, nineteen, twenty that are reaching out to me and asking uh, you know asking training questions, knowing that I've been in that same exact spot. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, one thing I noticed, like just following you on Facebook and everything. Like over the past probably two years, you've gotten super lean and jacked. Like you're looking pretty solid. Can you <laughs> can you fair. outline that approach that you used? Yeah. So for me, I never want to see a decrease in performance. I know there's going to be you know some age related decline in some of those aspects. So first off, in my training, I I do try to make or reinforce the point that I want to do something that's going to be athletic in nature, whether it's going to be an explosive throw, whether like a med ball slam, a medicine ball back toss, a rotational throw, um, an explosive type push up, um, or you know an explosive jump, something along those lines. I try to make sure I always have one of those components directly into my program because you know as we go through that aging process one thing we really stopped doing is we stopped playing all the sports that we did growing up that helped us get in shape and, and build that passion and stay active and stay lean and to be able to reinforce and continue to hold on to those same kind of explosive qualities one helps me improve performance you know in the gym and if i want to go you know play a pickup game somewhere um but also in terms of how it helps you in the gym when you're doing these explosive movements we can get into some more of this later but we're talking about things that are in going to increase central nervous system activation improve muscle fiber recruitment so you know by including a few things that are more athletic say a squat jump before getting into a a squat itself well i'm also firing up as many fast twitch muscle fibers as i can and over time that's really allowing me to progressively continue to train a little bit heavier train harder and continue to make progress in the gym um so yeah if we're looking at like an overall you know system that that i that i really ascribe to and recommend for people we're gonna do some sort of explosive movement we're gonna do some sort of main overload movement whether it's going to be like a squat clean bench deadlift one of these major compound movements and then like i said as we get into more physique focused stuff as we get further in the workout then we're going to start hitting our volume we're going to get that metabolic stress and some of those components directly into it okay and where would you program like less talked about things like the core and uh, mobility you know generally i take care of um i'm going to break that up into two pieces so generally i break up the mobility component directly into my warm-up in and of itself mm -hmm. so you know when we're looking at a warm-up you know we're looking to activate all the tissues and open up good ranges of motion so we can move safely with the big movements that we want to improve on so what we'll do is we'll go through and we'll improve mobility and then stability directly one after another right in the warm-up um, as it comes to core training and some of those aspects there is some of that directly built into the warm-ups that i do and recommend for all my clients just so we can kind of make sure we get some of it out of the way because you know when things get busy what's the one thing we skip uh probably conditioning probably core definitely not biceps yeah. um but beyond that you know say if i'm working in more of a hypertrophy rep range and creating some sort of fatigue is the goal and creating that metabolic stress to trigger muscle growth uh then we're going to tie it a little in a little bit later into the workout so for example it could be um say if we've done a lower body session that, that had a a jump it had a squat and a walking lunge maybe we're going to tie in a um an advanced like an rkc plank with an rdl and then finish off with a pallet press and some sort of leg finisher. Um, so I'll hit it first. I'll hit core work a little bit in the very beginning just to make sure all those deep intrinsic stabilizers are going to be there in firing. So the spine is protected and we're going to have some pain-free performance. Uh, but then I'll tie it in towards the end when, you know, we're not as concerned about having that full rest period and we're, you know, just trying to finish off the workout. Very cool. Um, and then what about if you have two people, let's say one guy, he wants to look like an athlete with act without actually being an athlete and then you have another guy on the other side who actually is an athlete uh the difference between the two mm -hmm. so if the guy that's going to be an that already is an athlete uh we just have to look at the programming in terms of you know what is their sports season and what are the demands of their sport specifically so you know if i have somebody that is um say they're in season playing basketball they're going to have a ton of jumps and stuff like that already directly in the program. Their legs are getting absolutely pounded. So what we're going to want to do is obviously dial back the volume on a lot of the movement patterns and stuff like that that are getting hit directly into a sport. And you can apply this really in any given direction. Training volume is going to be lower for somebody that is actively competing in a sport um, when it comes to what you're doing in the weight room. As it comes to somebody else who is, you know, 
they want to be jacked, but they want to maintain that athleticism, get, maybe get more athletic. Well, that is going to be the components that I was just talking about. We're going to have something explosive directly in the beginning. So we're going to increase, um, you know, service, central nervous system function. We're going to improve coordination, some of those different aspects. We're going to have a pure strength component. Um, depending how far they want to take the physique stuff is going to determine, you know, how much volume we're going to hit in terms of um, things in a hypertrophy rep range and, you know, in that 6 to 12 to 15 range. And then a conditioning component as well. Um, you know, conditioning tends to be a very unsexy thing to talk about. But at the end of the day, when people do not have work capacity, then they try to do something athletic. Well, that's when technique goes out the window and we can't maintain um, good solid body positions. And that's when we open the door for injury. So in terms of the two biggest components we would add to somebody who's looking to get more athletic, but not necessarily, but not necessarily be a competitive athlete, we look at doing something explosive in the beginning and then making sure we do have some semblance of conditioning a couple times a week. And in terms of conditioning, we're talking about anything from jump rope to sprints to sleds to a barbell complex. Just getting some things are going to get them active and moving. Okay. So with conditioning, how do you feel about uh, long, slow conditioning compared to the conditioning that you just spoke about? Um, you know, if your sport is long, slow conditioning <laughs> such as uh such as running go for it but um if you're looking to optimize your physique it is not the best option out there for you um and honestly if you're a busy guy like a lot of people that i work with if a lot of times going for a run for 45 to 60 minutes is not a practical way for you to spend your time nor see the results that you want so um yeah long slow steady state stuff you know it can work for short periods of time but it seems to be about uh, after a couple weeks of making that a focus for conditioning the benefits are very much limited and then we're looking at things that you know such as an increased cortisol response that could lead to you know some detrimental gain in terms of performance and strength so ideally you know work out with a high intensity for your conditioning um you really push that tempo and whatnot or keep it very if it's going to be low intensity keep it low low intensity at that point you know what i mean it's like keep it high or keep it low um i wouldn't spend too much time in the middle yeah for sure so let's go, you mentioned basketball, but I want to go to football. I know you're a cheesehead you're from Wisconsin. If you trained the Green Bay Packers, how would you kind of organize their training? So we're getting really specific here for football. Um, and let's talk a bit in season as well as off season. Okay, so first and foremost, most important thing, especially when we're looking at guys with big contracts like this uh no one can be healthy if they're not on the field so first and foremost we have to prevent as many injuries as possible um as it would come to the training itself in both compo or in both areas i would look at creating a movement training component so actual separate workouts where we're focusing on movement mechanics we're talking about um, sprinting mechanics in terms of acceleration then a top end speed we're also talking change of direction def like definitively working on improving those qualities you know a lot of people want to talk directly about squat bench deadlifts and apply this to uh, rate of force production and what's needed for different you know different sports like yeah this is important but nothing has as much carryover in terms of a sport in terms of act except for actively you know, like moving in the same way that you would for a sport you know, there is a lot of technical things a lot of, you know, strength coaches tend to ignore when it comes to an acceleration mechanic or a top end speed mechanic or an agility mechanic that can lead to, you know, shaving time off of a drill such as a 40 or helping you get that extra step on an opponent or being able to change the direction and get back to accelerating down the field a little bit faster. So first and foremost, yeah, there would be a movement component that would be the first focus directly in the program um, if we're looking at a workout in and of itself. So we'd go through a uh, some movement training. It would probably be some like short sprints and acceleration work two days per week, a top end type speed day. So that's where we're talking about some of the longer distances where you can also tie in, tie in conditioning and then a change of direction component. Um, in terms of what we're doing in the weight room, generally what I would focus on is um, on the days that would be a heavy sprint day, we would also hit our heavy work in the weight room. So what I'm, what I'm referring to here is the idea of intensive versus extensive demands um, intensive demands are things that are very demanding on the nervous system we're talking about heavy weight we're talking about fast sprint we're talking about high jumps um, this isn't necessarily a lot of volume but it's a lot of work right this is like highly intense stuff where your body 
is generating as much force as possible. So we would focus on creating those intensive days and then an extensive day, we're gonna be focusing a little bit more on volume and potentially a conditioning component. So uh, we'll say Monday, Thursday would be intensive days. That would be the direct sprint work. This would be the acceleration work. We'd have a little bit of a break in the training to allow some central nervous system recovery and uh, in a little bit, you know, get some food in, some different components like that. And then we would dive into more of our heavy, pure strength work, our explosive work like cleans, and then start to work, um, you know, once these guys are fatigued into some inju injury prevention stuff towards the end of the workout in and of itself. Uh, for example, looking at a Tuesday, Friday workout, we're talking extensive, cool, we did our movement stuff in the beginning, uh, allow that recovery period once again, and then we would dive into um, just hitting some higher rep volumes, right? We could get some hypertrophy work if it's given or needed for a, for a particular position or client um, and, and just work to get dial back some of the demands in the nervous system but also get enough training volume so we're able to support the lean muscle tissue that these guys need to you know walk around at 280 and 10 percent body fat and be jacked out of their minds mm -hmm. um in terms of how that would differ in season in season it's going to be a very customized approach based on the health of the individuals and of the team as a whole um a lot of the movement skills we would dial back quite a bit but we'd still want to make sure we're reinforcing those so no bad habits are brought in um you know think of like a false step and different things like that that you might know that you might see um old habits that can creep up just so we stay sharp but once again that volume is going to be low um in the gym we're going to work primarily in just being able to maintain strength and explosiveness but working around the injuries you know those guys get so beat up and like you see what's on the injury report but they're much more extensive than you know what we're truly actually seeing you know um, on the injury report before we make our fantasy football lineups so uh, my answer to that one is it somewhat depends but we'd be looking at doing a lot of things that are going to help reinforce good body positions we're going to look at common injury sites such as knees ankles shoulders and try to provide a lot of structure pain-free pulling volume stuff like that to uh, reduce injuries and, and kind of use training as a tool for injury prevention rather than improving performance to a greater extent once you're in season cool very cool so how would you kind of um what's the word? how would you maintain strength in a season do you follow something like dan john's rule of 10 where it's just like low volume higher intensity or um, what kind of approach do you go for well, this would be specific to uh, to positions. If we're looking at guys that are bigger, uh, we're looking at like offensive and defensive linemen. These guys, they do have explosive movement, but they are also having more of a pure heavy strength component, right? They are pushing against other big body guys and have to generate a lot of force. They have to generate it fast, but not as fast as someone who's like a defensive back who has to generate a lot of force, but they have to do it quickly rather than having that high like total strength component so guys are going to be lighter more speed athlete components i'm talking like backs and receivers and, and defensive backs we would focus more on like the speed strength aspect of training so we would hit some more sub maximal weights focusing on maximizing rate of force development so um training those guys a little bit lighter while still interspersing some of the heavy heavy work in of itself similar to a dan john model where we're talking about high intensity but low total volume um but that's just going to differ a little bit based on that position. So I would say both big guys and small guys are going to have an explosive component to what they're doing, but they're also going to have that pure strength component. It's just going to vary based on the demands of their position, how much in each area that we focus on. Does that make sense? Yeah, I like it. So do you think you would ever want to be like the strength coach for the Packers? I mean, that would be pretty cool, man. Honestly, <laughs> That would be, uh, yeah, that would be excellent. That would be really cool. All right. So Packers management, if you're listening to this, call up call up Eric Bach right here because uh, obviously he knows what he's talking about. Hey, I'm down, man. My, uh, my parents' house is about three miles away. I mean, I, I would be there every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so you run a Facebook group called Minimalist Muscle. Can you describe your kind of minimalism approach for building muscle? Yeah, so you know what I find in general with most clients I end up working with is time is their biggest constraint. Now, you know, we can say things that sound sexy on a sound bite, they're like, oh, we all have the same twenty four hours a day and and Phil Nike gets a workout in and Bill Gates gets a workout in and they manage the biggest companies in the world. But at the end of the day, the 
best program you can do is going to be the one that you're going to be able to do consistently. And for me and for the clients that I work with, it's generally finding something or a program that's going to be minimalist in nature, meaning we're not looking for the best program based on, you know, every scientific piece of literature we can find. We're looking for the program that they will first do consistent and then build the habits on and up from that point. You know, it's like, uh, I can't remember the exact quote or where it came from, so I'm going to try not to butcher it, but the perfect program done inconsistently will always lose to the imperfect program done consistently. So for me, the most important thing is ensuring training consistency because ensuring training consistency is going to help us make sure we're getting a good balanced approach to training. We're stimulating our main muscle groups on a more frequent basis and we're not leaving big gaps in training in and of itself. So we're going to be able to get strong. We're going to be able to build muscle by first focusing on that consistency factor rather than chasing the perfect program every couple weeks failing because life gets in the way and then jumping onto the next perfect program ensure consistency first and then we'll focus on the more you know essential or the other components as we get going Mm -hmm. very cool and then what about nutrition what are your philosophies with that you know for nutrition um you know, nutrition is always a tough one because there's so many dogmatic views when it comes to, uh, you know, to the industry, right? It's like you have to do paleo, you have to do intermittent fasting, you have to do six meals or your metabolism is going to slow down. You know, at the end of the day, it's like disregard most of that shit and focus on eating good, high quality foods. And we know what those are. Like, I'm not going to get in the battle of like what's clean versus what's not. But honestly, just eat some lean protein, eat the best quality protein sources that you can get, whether it's, you know, grass fed beef in, in wild caught fish, um, get fruits and vegetables during each meal and carbohydrates to support your activity. One simple way I break it down for my clients. Cool. Imagine your plate during every single meal. If half fits fruits and veggies, one quarter is a lean protein source and one quarter is going to be a starchy carb, like a sweet potato, potato or rice or oatmeal. Um, that's a really simple way to make sure you're eating better than about 99% of the people that are out there. Uh, if we want to get more specific in terms of stuff like that, um, the best diet, I believe Brian Cron, I saw him say this uh, in the last week or so, was like the best diet is the one you don't know you're on. And that comes down to changing the small habits day by day so you're able to build behaviors that help you lose weight or build muscle and then keep that new physique that you're working towards. So big takeaway is don't be overly dogmatic one way, one way or not with nutrition. Um, as I'm sure you've seen with your clients, there are a million different approaches that can work. Mm-hmm. But instead, focus on the best quality food that you can get. Um, use that plate example that I mentioned. And then from there, continue to build the habits that are going to help you maintain the progress that you're making and then keep those new behaviors so you don't realize you're on a diet. And that's going to be what's going to help you achieve that long-term success in terms of performance or in terms of the physique that you want. Yeah, I like that because it seems a bit more flexible. Um, Because if you look at it, you know, people in Canada or let's say people in Ontario are going to eat differently than someone in Wisconsin compared to someone in Florida to someone in California to someone in Mexico. Like we all have our different types of foods for that region. Um, So we can't all be eating like the exact same thing on this same cookie cutter meal plan because we're our cultures are just different even though our cultures are so similar um what we eat it varies so much so when you just have this like plate approach you can you can kind of plug and play whatever you eat like if you're down in the south you can put your collard greens in there for your for your vegetables and uh and if and if you're in like idaho well your starchy carbs are going to be potatoes right Dude, exactly. And I, honestly, I love just how you phrase that entire thing. It's like there's so many different factors that, you know, if we look at nutrition just cut and dry, um, it doesn't do it any justice when we focus on all the things that really come together for food. You know, we have different socioeconomic status, what you can buy for food, what you can afford, um, the way that a particular region of the country or the world eats is all going to play a role where you know, one plan that works perfectly for you might not work for me and vice versa. You know, you, it, it's tough to be overly dogmatic with that stuff, but instead it's like, just focus on the key principles that are going to help you be successful across the board. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause to tell you the truth, if it were up to me, I would drink pure maple syrup every meal. Well, that'd be great. Yeah. A little creatine in there. Imagine, <laughs> the, uh, imagine the size gains. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the waist would be getting pretty big. I could tell you that much. <laughs> Get one of those waist trainers, right? <laughs> yeah and uh do what they used to do in like old victorian times with um oh, i forget what that thing's called that the women used to wear to tie up and make their waist small yeah definitely mm-hmm. um 
So what are you currently doing right now with your training? Right now with my training, I'm, um, you know, things have been really crazy in terms of just in terms of business in general and getting a lot of clients and, you know, just kind of getting over the, the new year. So when, when there are a lot of things going on there and clients coming in. So uh, my recent approach has been a little bit lower, um, lower training volume in a given workout, but fairly frequent workouts. So I've been training um, about six or seven days a week. But some of these workouts are only 20, 25 minutes, some are 40, 45 minutes. Um, and the reasoning for this is one, it lets me stay sharp, lets me you know, keep building the habit because the more frequently we expose our body to a particular stimulus, the more ingrained that stimulus becomes. So if you're trying to learn new movement, the more often you do it, the better it's gonna be. So for me, that lets me keep the sword sharp without necessarily overloading my body past what I'm able to recover from. Um, so a lot of times my workouts will be, say we'll have four structured strength days, we'll have uh, like an upper lower, upper lower split, and then the other two to three days, uh, this is the idea I got from Christian Thibodeau called a neural charge workout. And a neural charge workout in and of itself is focused on using explosive movements, such as like jumps and throws and some of the things we talked about beforehand, in a, in a short circuit where you're focusing primarily on maximizing your performance in each of these lifts. So for example, I would do something like a, like a squat jump for, for three to five reps, um, I would walk around, pace around the gym, let my heart rate calm down, let myself relax, and then I'd go to my next exercise, which could be a clapping push-up. Same thing, maybe five to 10 reps there. I'm gonna walk around the gym, let my heart rate calm down, and then I'm gonna go to maybe another jump. It could be a broad jump. Okay, three to five reps there, walk around, take a break, you kind of get the idea, mm -hmm. and then add uh, an explosive throw. Now what we do is like we're not trying to make this workout some crazy, metcon explosive circuit where you're blasting yourself into oblivion it's completely focused on having the best quality rep at each point allowing your body to recover and just stimulating the nervous system enough where you're able to improve performance you're able to get some like protein synthesis directly within the muscle improve you know insulin sensitivity and uh and continue to improve these explosive patterns but incorporating short workouts like this broken up throughout your day um, works for a lot of my busy clients when they're not able to necessarily dedicate 60 to 90 minutes to the gym on a consistent basis by doing something smaller and, um, and more frequently, you're able to build that habit of training and continue to, to work on those things going to help you train consistently in the long term, especially when more time opens up in your schedule. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So in terms of minimalist muscle and, um, and athletic training or are there any like programs that someone listening could go and uh, purchase off you and go check it out themselves? Yeah, so I have one that would be perfect um, given you know given what we focused on in this call called the Power Primer. So the Power Primer more or less is focused on using these same exact principles <clears throat> that we use with high performance athletes and being able to apply them in an intelligent way so you're able to build a body that looks as good as it performs. So. You know, what we're not talking about here, we're not talking about, you know, like a bicep specialization program and some of these things that always get a ton of fancy marketing, but instead what we're going to do is help improve the actual foundation of what you have and improve the way your nervous system functions. So you're able to improve your performance and then drive physique improvements off of that overall improvement in your performance. Yeah, that's sick. Yeah. So I'll definitely, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, and let's transition on to something that I do with everyone. I got this idea from Tim Ferriss. It's the rapid fire questions. <laughs> All right. And it's only a couple of them. And uh, they, the answers can be as long or as short as you want. Um, so you ready to go? Let's do it, man. All right. What kind of things are you doing in your life right now to bring you happiness? To bring me happiness? Well, honestly, I've just been spending more time with my wife. Hmm. that uh, that brings me happiness and um you know it's easy to get bogged down when you're when you're building a business and just grind 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 um but i've been working on shutting it down a little bit earlier uh during my evenings and making sure my phone is off in a different room and trying to be more present and live in the moment yeah that's awesome um what would your profession be if you weren't doing fitness wow hmm it's a damn good question man <laughs> If I was not doing fitness, <clears throat> I would probably, <laughs> I'd probably be an author. 
No, is that is that a cop out because I write all the time? <laughs> um, no, I'll accept it. You know what I thought you were gonna say is just in the back of my mind. I I just thought you would be a really good firefighter. You know what? I mean, I would love to you know, save some kittens from trees. That might be kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so if you were to go back, how old are you right now? Twenty-seven. Oh, so were you born in like ninety or eighty-nine? I'm eighty-nine. Yeah, same age as me, man. There we go. Yeah. Um, so if you were to go back in time and buy your 20-year-old self two books, one fiction and one nonfiction, which ones would you give yourself? I would give myself the mm, the power of less, help me embrace minimalism and focus on the most important components, and then uh, probably The Old Man in the Sea just because Ernest Hemingway create some great literature and um honestly it's just a good story cool um and lastly where can people learn more about you oh funny you should ask well (laughs) (laughs) i've got my website bachperformance.com um definitely hit me up there we're putting out uh putting out new content each and every week a lot of times we have two articles coming out Uh, but as you mentioned before the minimalist muscle facebook group it is a closed group so we do have to make sure we vet people so we don't get a bunch of spam in the group Mm -hmm. but if you want to be in a place where you can be with over 1300 people who are consistently looking to achieve better results in the gym build muscle lose fat and improve performance without feeling overwhelmed with all the information out there you know then give us a shot we definitely love to have you there um it's just an excellent supportive environment with a number of awesome coaches that are always chiming in and helping people you know improve their fitness and cut through a lot of the fluff that's in the industry so um hit me up on bach performance and then on facebook the minimalist muscle facebook group is a great spot to uh to find a really active community and and be part of something you know really bigger than any of us individually Awesome, and I'll, I'll definitely make sure to link all those in the show notes as well. Um, that brings us to the end of the interview. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Hey, I appreciate you having me. This was a uh, no, it's, it's always fun to chat, man. I haven't we haven't chatted in the last couple of months, but um, it's good to catch up. Yeah, for sure. All right, and Jason Maxwell here with Eric Bach from Bach Performance, and I'll be seeing you guys next time. <laughs>